Uh, welcome everyone uh, to church, uh, to the house of God, and I, we pray together that God would bless us uh, with his words. The song that we just heard, uh, Speak Life by Toby Mac, says, We can turn our hearts uh, through the words we say. Mountains crumble with every syllable. Hope can live or die. I think it speaks a lot of truth about what we say and what we do with our words, and definitely our words have such power in our lives. So that, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Which basically means you can make someone come alive with your words, or you can figuratively kill someone <laughs> with your words. And we get to eat the fruit accordingly uh, in our lives. So what, how we live our life is wh- what we say and what we do with our words. And uh, uh, the researchers say that we speak about 16,000 words a day, right? Uh, 16,000, probably women speak a little more uh, and men speak a little less than that, but just roughly uh, 16,000 words, that's equivalent to a 60-page book. So think about this. You are writing, actually, writing a 60-page book every day with your words. And the question is, how much of it is life-giving and how much of it is death-giving? So the Bible says, with our words, we can make someone alive or we can kill someone. And think about the idea that you are writing this small book every day, and we have to reevaluate what we are writing in that book. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 2 says right here, If you could find someone whose speech was perfect, perfectly true, you'd uh, have a perfect person, a perfect control of life. So this is what we are trying to do. We want to gain mastery of our speech and become the perfect person God wants us to be. And for this goal, uh, we need to understand four uh, things about speech. And I want to uh, go over that. Number one is speech is from God. Speech, the words that we speak, is from God. And there are many uh, speculations about how language began. And I did a little research, and some theory uh, says that uh, our <clears throat> language became uh, by imitating uh, some natural sounds around, around us, like uh, ding-dong, like, you know, like uh, uh, bow-wow, la-la, and poo-poo, and you know, all these different things. And you know, they believe that people started mimicking that, and that became like, what's poo-poo? You know, poo-poo means this, and then they, it became you know, language. And some people think language developed over thousands of years and took many, many years to develop at, uh, to that level. And some researchers claim that they became in a single lip, leap, uh, creating through one mut- mutation the complete system of language in the brain. That's fascinating, right? How could we, boop, oh, now we can speak, right? That's fascinating. The Bible says that God gave us the language when he created us like himself. So Bible is clear that God gave us the complete set of complex language to each one of us. So when Adam, uh, God created Adam, even though he was by himself, no one to speak to, he was able to already uh, speak to God, communicate with God, name animals, right? And then write the most beautiful poem to his own wife. He was able to think, express, and communicate and manage God's creation uh, with his words. So it is fascinating. The language is proof that we didn't evolve from a single cell by chance, but an intelligent God created us with language to speak, express, and manage his own creation. The complex language in our DNA is proof that all-knowing God coded complex information in us so that we can be his image bearer. So language is a gift from God, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is what makes us a human being, the image bearer 
of God. So every time we uh, speak words, you know, speak language, we need to be reminded that God has given me this ability. You know, God has given me these words to speak, to breathe life into it, and to uh, flourish with the life that he has given us. So we understand that speech is God's gift and a privilege. We also understand that speech is also a liability to each one of us, right? Because your speech reflects who you are. Uh, Jesus said, what is in your heart will come out through your mouth. So behind every word that we speak are our thoughts, our emotion, our intention. And this is why God holds us accountable for every word that we speak. Because uh, our words reveal who we are, what's inside us, and it does make an impact around us. So we need to just understand about speech that God is a gift, it's a privilege, but we are responsible for the speech that we make. Now, second understanding is that speech has power, and we would all agree this. And I want to go through the book of Proverbs, you know, very briefly to kind of highlight what the book of Proverbs says about, uh, about our language, all right? So isn't it interesting that God uh, called him, calls himself the Word, all right? So God's nickname is the Word. God speaks, and then he creates things. So I uh, put out some uh, verses right here. <laughs> God created heaven and earth with his words. When he breathed the word, everything started being. God also holds the whole world by his word. The scripture says it sustains. Uh, the, the next one says sustaining all things by his powerful word. So this natural law and everything that we take it for granted are controlled and uh, managed by his own powerful word. And also, he will judge the world by his, by his word. And the John 12, 48 says, the very words that Jesus speaks will come back and judge everybody, and that will bring the whole history into, uh, to the end. So this world was created and is put together by God's word, and it will end by God's word, and we understand the tremendous power that words has because God used words to, uh, to create us. And another point is that the words that we speak has such a power as well. Because, I mean, think about uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, when Jesus Christ came and healed incurable diseases and uh, released people demon, uh, from demon possession and raised the dead from, from death, is basically through his words. He spoke, and his word has such a power that the nature, disease, and everything just obey, obeyed his own word. What about the words that we speak? How do we get saved? The scripture says right here, says that as we confess that Jesus is Lord, as we confess our faith with our mouth, that God gives us salvation. So think about eternal life our regeneration, and the hope that we have, right? Forgiveness of sin, all this is given as gifts as we speak, as we confess our faith to God. It's the faithful words that God listen, listens and do wonderful things in our lives. What about our prayer? We pray, we call out to God, and God says God will show us wonderful things in our lives. I mean, our words have such power. God does listen when we speak. God does respond. In a spiritual realm, even when we speak with authority, things happen. So we need to understand the power of God's word. And the third uh, fact is that God, uh, speech has consequences. And everybody understands this because right here in James 3, 5, and 6 says, you know, you can use words destructively. I mean, words can really destroy things. I mean, this is a message translation, which kind of more contemporary. It says, a word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. 
a careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. Which means as we use our words in a destructive way, we almost experience hell in our lives. Chaos and dis dissension and all these things because our words has power, and I'm sure you already have experienced it in your life, right? So let me go through uh, some of the pro uh, verses in, in the Proverbs. Uh, we hurt others by lying, right? It says, uh, like a club or sword or sharp arrow is the man who gives false testimony against his neighbor. Let me just go through really quickly. It hurts others by gossiping. You know, mean people spread mean gossip, and then it really breaks the friendship. It hurts others by flattery, lying tongue, uh, hates its victims, and flattering mouth works ruin, and we have experienced that. It hurts others by speaking in anger. We many times do this. An angry man stirs up dissension, and a hot-tempered temp hot one commits many sin. We are very vulnerable when we get angry with our words. And we hurt others with careless speech. Answering before listening is both stupid and rude, right? We become stupid when we speak too much, the next, uh, next point says. He says, the more talk, the less truth. The wise measure their words. So we need to be really careful. Jesus even warned uh, about hurting other people with words. There will be huge consequences. Matthew 5.22 says, If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. Legally speaking, you can get in trouble by saying the wrong thing. But more in, in, in a spiritual realm, if you curse someone, you are in danger of the, the fires of hell. I mean, you will have spiritual consequences as, as well. And Jesus was harsh about the words that we speak. But in contrast to that, we can also use our words constructively. Let's go through the Proverbs once again. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of a righteous man is a well uh, fountain of life. It can actually bring life. You know, it can actually provide something good to other people. Next verse says, The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. Right? It just constantly flows out, giving life, giving hope, and flourishment. The next verse says, Gracious words are, uh, are honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. And we love this. When uh, someone speaks such a encouraging words, we're like, oh, that's so sweet. Right? I, I was crushing, but it heals me. There's a sense of you know, the healing in, in good words. The next verse, uh, 15, 1 says, A gentle response diffuses anger, but a sharp tongue kindles a temper fire. It diffuses anger. It brings peace. Uh, Proverbs 25, 15 says, Patience can persuade a prince. Prince is a powerful man. I mean, it's hard to change prince's mind, but if you really are patient with your words, you can change someone else's mind, and soft speech can break bones. It's hard to break bones, but they will change their will if you are wise with your words. And lastly, the words of the godly encourage many, but fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense, right? We can encourage many people, and then we can give life. So let's imagine once again that each one of us are writing a 60-page book every day, right? And then we need to ask, what are we writing in that book that we write every day? Okay, are you uh, writing, you know, destructive words, or are you being constructive? This is in speech, are you uh, um, giving life or are you giving death? And we need to really evaluate that. So for a brief moment, just think about all the words that you speak throughout the day. Am I giving life? Am I constructing? Am I building? 
and then giving life to the ones that I speak to? Or am I more destroying things? Am I more inducing death uh, in my life? And that's really criteria for wise living and blessed living. Because the uh, scripture says in Proverbs 18.21, those who love it will eat its fruit, right? It's it's not a a no-brainer that whatever we do with our language will, you know, we, we will experience the result of it. Message Bible puts it this way. Words kill, words give life. They are either poison or fruit. You choose. (laughs) Less straightforward. I mean, we, the amazing thing is that we get to choose. We have power to choose our words, and we have power to use our words for different goals in our lives. So uh, let's talk about now, uh, you know, to apply all this into how then we can, uh, you know, we can bring life. We can speak life, as, as the title of this message says. And I want to uh, underline four. Probably there are many more things that we can do about this, but just four important things that I think Scripture is underlining. Number one is by getting a new heart. I think this is really important because we tend to focus on, okay, what, how can I speak better? What should I not say? Oh, we, we become very technical about our words. But if you really read the scripture, words comes out, as Luke 645 says, you know, it's in a, from the, the treasury of our heart, word comes out. And the next verse, Matthew 15, 19 says, well, Jesus said, in your heart, is full of evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. And naturally, when we have that heart in us, brewing in us, in anger, then naturally when circumstances rise, we would naturally speak out the words that will induce death and destruction in our lives. So the issue is our heart. How can we change my, our hearts first so that our words will naturally flow out of the fountain of life into my surroundings. And the scripture in Galatians 5.22 also says different set of heart. The spirit, however, produces in human life fruits such as this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, fidelity, tolerance, and self-control. And the Bible says no law, nothing can stop this, right? It is, if it is there, it is there. It will produce fruits in your life. So the, 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 uh, the conclusion is that we need to have regenerated heart. This is why we need God. We need Jesus. This is why we need to confess our own sin and ask for forgiveness. And forgiveness on the things that has been done to our hearts as well in our lives so that we can get rid of bitterness and anger and resentment. We need to receive new heart from God and let the Holy Spirit reside us and keep on producing this good fruit so that we can, out of that overflow, speak to other people in the same way, giving life and producing you know, beautiful fruits in our lives. And this is the first thing. So as we read the, uh, the book of Proverbs, we understand more and more, God, I cannot do this. I'm not capable of doing this. My heart is, is rotten. My heart is full of anger. How can I just speak wisely? The key is that, God, would you change my heart? Give me new heart and fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me uh, have self-control so that what I speak to other people and to myself even can be the things that God would desire. That is the first step. Now, the first, the second step is by renewing your mind. Because even though we have the new heart, right, regenerated heart, it is really hard to speak positively in our lives. I mean, even I struggle at all, the, all the time with my wife and with my friends and my colleagues. I mean, I just speak, 
you know, in the spur of the moment, and my temper comes out, my impatience comes out, and I start attacking people. I go like, why did I do that? Why did I say in such a way? And I regret that, but I keep doing that. That's because our, we have a natural inclination to be selfish and loveless. This is the starting point. We have to understand that I, my natural inclination will be to speak in an evil way. Then what do we do? We need to constantly renew our mind. If we don't renew our mind, even though we have the good heart, we will do something that we don't desire. So Romans chapter 12 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The Bible says you need to renew your mind on a daily basis with the truth, not your common sense, not your smart you know, schemes and things like that. You need to just, just recode your mind every day with the truth of God. And then as you do that, number one, you are not going to follow uh, the pattern of this world. Number two, you are going to be able to transform your life from within. And then finally, you are going to be able to discern what is good, what is perfect, what is pleasing to the Lord. Right? You're going to have that sense of wisdom, sense of self-control, and then you're going to be able to practice that out of your renewed mind. Right? And the next thing is by speaking life. And I want to dwell a little more on this one. Because, you know, after we, are, we have the, renew, uh, the new heart and renewed mind, you know, that's not enough. Now we need to do something, and I want to coin that as we need to speak life, uh, you know, in our eyes. Because we understand that the most powerful uh, change agent in this universe are words that we speak. Think about that. The words that you speak, that you utter, is the most powerful thing, right? God listens to it, you listen to yourself, and other people will listen to it. So the first area is that what are you saying to yourself in a con constantly? <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty on this, right? Because I'm introvert and I think a lot and I, I'm more critical of myself. And I always kind of, you know, point finger at myself and, yeah, I mean, you're not good, right? And then I, I dwell in how I feel about, you know, things. And I dwell in what my circumstances tells me all the time, right? And I sometimes dwell what other people say about me. So when I keep, you know, keep saying and repeating with my mouth and my mind what uh, other people say, what my sinful nature says, then I speak death to my own being. And as I do that, I believe that lies. Right? And I come under that authority. And I give in to that, and I somehow believe that I am all that that my mind is speaking to myself. Right? So first thing we need to do is, by faith, we need to speak what God is speaking to each one of us. We need to discern that. Is it me saying? Is it circumstance saying? Is it what other people are saying? Or is it what God says about me? What God is trying to tell me? We need to take that and repeat that over and over again, and we need to stand on that truth. And I, I wrote right here, we need to echo what God says to each one of us in faith. Number one is, who is God to you? And who are you in God? And what has God promised you? This promise is another amazing concept. Because, I mean, promise is something that is not, has not been actualized yet. Right? But by faith, believing in faith, uh, in the promise means that you kind of know, you believe that it will happen. So you kind of bring that future fulfillment into your present situation and then you claim it as if it's real at your own circumstance. That's what faith promise is. 
So as you read more about God's promise on you that God will be with you, you are children of God, you have all the inheritance in God, I mean, all that God will give you wisdom and God will lead your way and all these things, right? And there's grace of God. You take that as a promise of God, even though you don't see that in your, act, in your present situation, you claim that, bring it to your present situation, and then you claim that, God, I believe that you are with me. I'm precious. I'm forgiven. I'm all worth uh, loving to you. And my future is in your hand. I trust you that. And all these people are beautiful gifts to me. I need to serve them. I need to minister to them. I mean, just keep instilling God's promise in your life. Then you get to live out that promise right here in your, in your present. Another question is, what do you say to other people all the time? Uh, sometimes, I, I did that a long time ago. I, I just record myself. When I talk to my wife, I just record myself and listen to that. I mean, I'm full, right? Listening to your own recording, especially like casual conversation, is like, wow, it's torturing. Like, why did I say that? Why did I say that way, right? I mean, I could have responded a different way. I mean, it's amazing what we say to other people and forget about it. What, <laughs> right? And no wonder other people, you know, are getting upset because I did just that. So it'll be interesting to kind of look back on your 60-page book, you know, every day, and then kind of say, what, what, what did I speak? How did I treat these people, right? So, uh, you know, every speech, uh, you know, you have to understand that every speech presents you with an opportunity. Remember, speech is a choice. You know, sometimes you feel like, oh, what could I have said? I mean, that was the right thing to say. No, you had the choice. So just think about speech as, as, a, as an opportunity. Now I can choose to speak life, or I can choose to speak death. I can speak constructively, or I can speak destructively. And what am I going to choose? As if when I'm writing my paper, I, I go like, should I use this word, or should I use different word? Should I put it this way in my sentence to better express my, my intention, or should I put it different way. I mean, when we write email or when we write our, our own paper, I mean, we do that all the time. We choose carefully what, what words to speak and how we put it in a sentence. Why can we not do the same when we speak to other people? If you are more intentional about it, more strategic about it, and more careful about the choice of words and the, 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 the phrase that we use, then we might be able to induce life into, into our surroundings. And people will experience that and their lives will be changed. And one story that I want to uh, conclude with is uh, from Ezekiel 37. So uh, God took uh, prophet Ezekiel to this desert with dry bones. We understand that, right? So there are thousands of scattered, dry, scary bones in the, in the desert. And God asked uh, the prophet uh, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And his logical sense says, no. When you die, you're dead. When your body decomposes, decomposes then it's done. There's no way that these bones can you know, come, come back to life. But he wisely says, well, I don't know. And I don't have any control. But God, you know. You know, that, that's a very smart answer. You know what to do, right? You, you will do whatever you want to. I kind of want to wait and see what you would do. And God says in verse 4 is this, Prophesy these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath to enter you and, and you will come to life. So what Ezekiel was asked to do is, okay, don't put your common sense, don't put your uh, judgment or even, you know, your uh, idea into this word. Why speak what I'm saying to these bones, to, to them, and then things will change. So it's really interesting how Ezekiel was to repeat what God said, 
and then obey in repeating them to this monk. And as he was uh, prophesying, the next verse is not here, but there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together, bones to bones. And I looked, the tendons and flesh appeared on them, skin covered them, but there was no breath. Isn't it interesting? I mean, at the word of God, these bones came together making loud noise. Probably that was the scariest scene ever, right? Like the zombies coming back to life, right? But interestingly, but still, it wasn't complete. There was no breath. I mean, it looked okay, but it wasn't moving because there was no breath. So God asked uh, the prophet Ezekiel once again, prophesy to, are we showing? Yeah, go. Uh, chapter 9, uh, verse 9. Let me have you read that. The next one. Okay, maybe not there. Uh, it says, uh, prophesy to the breath. Uh, prophesy, son of man, and, and say to this, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. And as he prophesied in verse 10, uh, the, the breath entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. You know, this was a vision that uh, prophet Ezekiel was to speak the word of God, the promise of God, what God is about to do, the, in, uh, the possibility of God, that God was presenting in these dry, bone, dead people, and he was to prophesy that, the word of God, and God, you know, in his vision, brought them back to life in stages. It doesn't happen all at once, but body came together, and then prophesy again, and the breath came, and then it stood up and became a large army to fight for the righteousness and for the kingdom of God. Right? So people really need to hear you saying what the Bible says, what God says. Many times we try our best to, yeah, say the right thing, you know, but that's not enough. If we pray a little more for that person, I many times get this idea that, oh, God really wants to speak to that person this, this thing, you know. Wants to speak life, wants to speak, you know, give little wisdom. And I sense what God is, wants to speak to that person, right? And then I get up and call or meet that person and say, hey, I felt like this is what you need, need to hear. And believe it or not, that person goes, wow, that's exactly what I need to hear. And then I see them coming back to life, getting encouraged, and standing up to become a strong warrior. Hey, we are ministers of the Word of God. Every uh, you know, speech presents with an opportunity. And as we speak what God is speaking to us and God, what God wants to, want us to convey to other people, miracle can happen. Think about all the people, all these people around you. I know many of them are annoying, bothering you, and you want to get out of that uh, it, it, their relationship sometimes, and you don't want to deal with certain people. But still, God wants us to speak to the dry bones, where it seems like there is no hope. But God wants us to obediently Repeat what he's trying to say to that person and then be the agent of life-giving power to that person. This is what it means to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. We are ambassadors. We are the spokesperson. We are the, we are the speaker for God. And we are to use our speech and vocabularies to minister to other people and then bring them back to life and help them to stand to do the work of God. So just think uh, freely, you know, wh who am I struggling with? What are some of the opportunities that I can, uh, you know, get hold of? And then really use that to induce life, to bring that person to life. There are so many people who are wanting to hear the hopeful words, that there is hope in God. 
that God is with them. God can forgive. God can erase their past. God can give their future. God can help them. I mean, all these life-inducing words are what this world is craving for, and God has called each one of us to do that. Lastly, let me end with this verse in Col- Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It is right here in the New Testament context. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. All right? The problem that we face is we don't know how to answer to everyone. We lose our, our words. But the Bible says, well, the key is, you know, uh, to let, letting our conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt. So let's imagine, full of, what, what does that look like when my conversation is full of grace? Full of grace, not legalistic, not mathematic, but full of grace, gift, leniency, tolerance, love, enough time. Second uh, imagery is seasoned with salt. Have you tasted something that is saltless? It's maybe good, but it's, you don't want to eat it. The same thing. It's a, it's a truth that you're trying to convey, but sometimes it needs salt. You need a little salt over it, right? With generous heart and loving, tender voice, enough time. Waiting, patience, I mean, all this little salt you need to sprinkle in the conversation and, and, and season a little bit so that the other person can hear it and eat it and then be, be healthy again. So I want to live uh, with this imagery that in every conversation, uh, you know, make it full of grace. Uh, repeat after me, full of grace, seasoned with salt. I just want you to memorize this. Every time you speak to someone, full of grace, seasoned with salt. Would you repeat that again? Full of grace, seasoned with salt. The song that we heard um, you know, at the beginning, uh, it ends like this. This is right here. It says, lift your head a little higher. Spread the love like fire. Hope will fall like rain when you speak life with the words you say. Raise your thoughts a little higher. Use your words to inspire. Joy will, will fall like rain when you speak life with the things you say. So speak life. Speak life to the dead, that deadest, darkest night. Speak light. Speak like when the sun won't shine and you don't know why. Look into the eyes of the brokenhearted. Watch them come alive as soon as you speak hope. This is the life that God has called us. And I pray that God would help us to speak life in Jesus' name to all those people that we come across on a daily basis. May God help us to obey these words. Let us pray. Mm -hmm.